Hello and welcome to this panel discussion about motion control concepts for automation as part of our Realizing the Potential of Industrial Robots series sponsored by Rockwell Automation. My name is Matthew and I will be your Global Spec Moderator and I want to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. The large window with the heading presentation in the upper left is the primary window for today. Just to the right of the main presentation window is the speaker bio window with background information on today's presenters. Just below that is the Q&A window. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of the window and click Submit. Your question will be placed in the queue to address when we get to the Q&A session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it and a tooltip will appear with a description of the button's function. And now, I would like to introduce our moderator for the Realizing the Potential of Industrial Robots series. Let's welcome Edgar Sauter. Edgar is a Senior Director of New Product Technology at CSA Group. He and his team looked at the technology horizon for new developments and applications that could present opportunities for CSA's test, inspection, and certification business. To read more about Edgar or any of our presenters today, please look at the speaker bio window right next to the main presentation window. And with that, I would like to pass things along to Edgar to lead us through today's discussion about motion control concepts for automation. Edgar, welcome to today's event. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. My name is Edgar Soter, Senior Director of New Product Technology at CSA Group, and I will be moderating in this panel today. So motion controls are developing very uh, rapid, quickly, enabling complex techniques and architectures that are unlocking new applications in robotics. So we will discuss this uh, about this technology in this panel discussion, this panel session. Today with us, we have Aaron Pratner, who is a director of robotics and autonomous systems for ASTM International, where he oversees standards development, training and workforce development efforts, and research and development funding. Aaron has written numerous articles about robotics and their role and impact on workforce development. He is in numerous boards and committees that develop curriculum for robotics training. With us, we also have Kevin Haug, uh, who is the iMotion go-to-market manager for Rockwell Automation. Kevin has been uh, providing industry mechatronic solutions to address customer needs for flexible manufacturing. After his graduation from Purdue in 1992, he served as a motion application sales engineer for 16 years before joining Rockwell Automation as a technical consultant. In the 13 years since, he has held many roles, including technical lead and OEM sales leader. We also have Dean Phillips, who brings 34 years of manufacturing experience. He is an advisor to SME's Smart Manufacturing Advisory Committee. Uh, he's also an accomplished speaker in IoT, AI, robotics, and artificial, uh, sorry, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. He is also an entrepreneur and has served on the board of directors or as an advisor for multiple technical committees. We also have Brian Gard Davies, who is a consulting engineer and roboticist with experience in various industries and applications. He has hands-on experience developing and deploying robotic arms, mobile robots, cobots, and more, along with a master's degree in mechatronics from Stellenbosch University. So Aaron, Kevin, Dean, and Brian, thank you for taking the time of being here with us and sharing your knowledge and experience with our audience. So innovations in mechanical and digital technologies have yield accurate and simplified controls for most industrial robots. The motors and actuators of today's machines are highly uh, precision and energy efficient designs that in many cases are optimized with drivers and sensor sensing equipment. Robotics now can be synchronized and streamlined in many ways. There are also magnetics that are creating highly adaptable means of material handling. And even more, uh, with digital enterprise, now those machines can be monitored at any time. So 
In today's panel, we'll discuss the nuances of those developments. But before we begin, let's take a time to uh, acknowledge our series sponsor. So Rockwell Automation is a global leader in industrial automation and digital transformation solutions. Rockwell's inherited expertise in industrial networks, sensing technologies, and digital software means it is one of the preeminent authorities for everything related to smart manufacturing. For more information, visit uh, rockwellautomation.com. This webinar is hosted by Global Spec, the world's largest online destination for industrial product sourcing and engineering information. So without further delay, let's start with our panel. And I would like to, to start with a very simple question for the benefits of those in our audience that are just new to this topic. What is motion control? What is it about? And what is uh, their importance in robotics? Uh, Kevin, this question would be for you. Great, thanks, Edgar. And, and uh, great question, right? So I think that, that we need to differentiate really between motor control and motion control. And when we refer to motor control, we're definitely referring to mostly single axis drive shaft turning type devices. But I think what we're going to talk about today and what, the, what you're asking from uh, the group here is really about motion control. And that applies uh, that we're talking about multiple axis of coordinated control as opposed to motor control. And so that implies a lot of, of ways that it will manifest itself. Mostly robotics is what we're seeing to address the, the challenges that we'll talk about on the call today, too, um, in, in, a, in a way that um, applies the, the robotics and motion control. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Now that we're talking about that, let's, let's now start talking about what are those uh, techniques, current uh, technologies that enable motion control, that make it... Uh, that help us achieve that. Uh, Brian, uh, could you please help us understand what are those uh, actuators, for example, and sensor device, devices using uh, for motion control today? Okay, so yeah, so in uh, robotic actuators, where you typically have an electric motor which carries out uh, the actual movement, uh, there are numerous uh, sensors inside the actu actuator which aid in the control of both the motor as well as the robot as a whole. So the, the robot um, system as a whole or application as a whole. So um, firstly, so the most um, common one would of course be either an encoder or a resolver attached to the output shaft of the motor for which you could accurately measure uh, the rotational angle of the motor shaft. So this is essential of course for uh, closing the uh, control loop of the motor so that you can finally uh, control the motor, um, and as well as for um, the actual operation of the um, the robot. So for, if you take, for example, a robot arm, which might be made up of, let's say, six axes, if you want to know accurately where that robot, where the end effector is in space, you need to, of course, know accurately each of the, the axes leading up to the end effector. Um, another example, of course, would be a wheeled robot or AGV type robot where you would like to accurately know um, how many times the, uh, the wheel has turned over uh, uh, you know, as a fraction, fraction of revolutions. And this, this feeds into um, odometry information such that you can have an um, approximation of where this uh, AGV is in its, in its environment. Um, furthermore, there might be, uh, we might use torque sensors. So the torque sensor would also be attached to the, the output shaft of the electric motor. Uh, the torque sensor would also feed back into the control loop to allow for a really fine uh, control and you know, have the motor move with really good sort of torque characteristics. So in terms of the whole robot, uh, especially with robot arms, you often have very um, or highly varying torque on each axis. And by having this torque sensor, you can really improve the control and get really nice smooth uh, motion of your your robot arm. Um, also, again, on the application side, you might have some kind of drilling or screwing application where you would like to accurately know exactly how much torque you are putting on your, your drill or your, your screw, such that you can um, successfully complete this task. Um, yeah, continuing with sensors, I would say, the, uh, for example, in Cobot, you might have a, a gyro sensor or a uh, also known as an IMU sensor. Uh, where you would really closely monitor each of the 
um, these signals coming out of the gyro and look for sort of anything unexpected. So any kind of uh, a spike, which is sort of uh, an unexpected uh, type of data set, which might indicate um, that the cobot has bumped against something. So that in turn, you might then, for example, stop stop the robot altogether or whatever other behavior you're looking for. Um, yeah, and finally, another actuator altogether, of course, would be a, a gripper type actuator uh, where you may have uh, four sensors in the, the fingers of the of the gripper to to accurately know exactly how much force you're applying to the object you're you're picking up. Wow! So today's robots are full of sensors and actuators. Then, yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. What about the motors? Because of course you get that that information. You use data to kind of retrofit the actuators and all that. But what about the motors? We hear a lot about a type of motor called a brushless DC motors. I mean, we yeah. see it a lot in our vehicles. Um, how are they being also using in robots and how? Yeah, cer certainly. So um, I would say brushless DC motors are the de facto motor in, in robotic actuators. Um, they are, to, to know why, I mean, essentially one just needs to look at all the advantages of a, of a brushless DC motor. So, I mean, firstly, they're very precise. Um, and that is often, you know, the the number one requirement uh, of a of a actuator or or robot system. Um, they have a really high power to weight ratio. So again, using the example of a robot arm, where you might have uh, six or seven or even eight um, actuators one after each other. Of course, weight is extremely important here. So having this high power to weight ratio uh, makes brushless DC motors uh, very beneficial to robot arms. Um, yeah, then there's then there's numerous advantages that come simply from not having um, brushes. So that immediately means um, low maintenance, um, and this translates to to long long life long lifetime of the the motor. Uh, in fact, the lifetime of the the motor is often dependent on the the lifetime of the bearings found in the motor. Um, they're simply more efficient. So when you don't have brushes, they're more efficient in the sense of converting electrical energy to actual actual rotational energy. Um, they're, they're more efficient in that sense. Um, electromagnetic interference is greatly reduced by, by simply not having brushes. Uh, many robot applications uh, um, require a, a, low, a low amount of um, EM interference. So to meet standards or to get certification, you would need to have a low amount of electromagnetic interference. Um, Finally, they can also, uh, they, they can cool by conduction. So you don't need sort of an airflow flowing over them to cool them down. That means you can have them in a nice enclosed housing, which of course keeps out uh, dust and other foreign particles. So that's, that's a further advantage. So yeah, so just with all these advantages, it means that uh, brushless DC motors are really the favored motor in, in, in robotic uh, actuators. Is there any room for other like type of motors, or that's kind of the the one use that that technology? Um, yeah, in my opinion, amongst current technology, no, there isn't uh, room for for other motors. I think unless you have a certain application where maybe a lower precision is is acceptable, but that's that's highly unlikely in industry. You know, as I said, that's often the number one requirement: uh, uh, the accuracy and precision. So I would say no. I think it would have to be some kind of new technology altogether, or some new breakthrough in motor technology that could possibly start to uh, replace brushes, brushes DC motors. Got it. Thank you, Brian. Now we talk about the sensors, the actuators, the data to manage it. Now the motors. And now I have a question for the audience, like for for not for sorry, not for the audience, for the panelists. Um, what about the drivers to control those those uh, motors? Like there is a one technology called I believe is variable frequency drive or something like that to kind of uh, variable frequency power to control the voltage that that goes to the to the motors. Like can some of you explain a little bit about that? And if there is any other type of technology that is also used that will be that we can share with the audience, that would be fantastic too. Yeah, I, I could I could start say a few things about uh, variable frequency drives. Um, yeah, so they they're great for speed control as well, and they also have really good 
uh, speed torque characteristics, but uh, they're they're not so great for for sort of precise position control. And often, at least in in robotics applications, you really do require uh, precise uh, position control. Um, they they're quite they're quite heavy. They have a they have a sort of bad sort of, or so, let's say a low power uh, power to weight ratio. So that makes them a little bit unsuitable for robotic arms, um, but perhaps in, in in wheeled robots, so AGV type robots, perhaps they could be used uh, there. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'd like to add to that real quick too, right? I think Sorry. Brian hit mostly okay, the, the nail on the head. I think that the, there's a couple of things in, in motion control versus motor control, right? That we talked about that are really key performance indicators. One of those is, is a, is, a, is a bandwidth of, of the amplifier. And, and really that's how fast the, the amplifier can respond to input. So typically to meet a, a price point in the market where you don't necessarily have to have that kind of response, the, the component selection of those drives uh, is adequate for the application. So by that, I mean, there's typically a little bit more additional cost in a servo driver and, and a, that type of high frequency control versus what you might get in a VFD, which is a lower frequency in, in control uh, because it doesn't necessarily always have to look at the feedback. It doesn't have to respond so quickly, right? So those, those components drive the, the cost and the price point and the response. So when, you, when you're looking at motion control applications, one of those KPIs that I talked about, performance indicators, is the inertia ratio, basically, between the motor and the, the payload. And the difference in that is what is the requirement for the bandwidth of the, ampli of the amplifier or the inverter. And so that's where you're looking at higher speeds to provide more accuracy, quicker starts, and even more important, quicker stops, right? So it's when you, it's when you can slow that load down quickly and, and control the load. So that's typically what some of the, the performance indicators that drive the price point and the selection of components for modern drives. I think that's a great point you made there too, because we, we can't ignore the fact that price does factor into people's decisions. And Without question, though, you want to get the best performance. You want to have that torque ratio, but you also need to have, as you mentioned, that inertia uh, is does become a big factor. The more weight I add, the bigger motors I put in, that's going to be, I got to move that. And I got to move it and start. And then, uh, as you mentioned, which is even more important, I got to be able to stop quickly. So how do I do that? You have to get the best performance out of those drives and out of the motors. So yeah, that's a great point. And, and I, I would also then add, as, as Dean just said, then after you look to determine on price of where's the safety aspects for all this, especially when you're looking at mobile robots, as, as Dean pointed out, more weight means it's going to be harder to stop. Can your drives stop that piece of equipment before it becomes a safety issue as well? So all of these, these are very key points when you're putting a system together from price to safety. You got a lot of decisions to make. What about reliability? Like we have mentioned performance, we have mentioned safety, which are key points. Um, but I'm listening to all these fancy uh, components that robots have today. Um, how how is reliability taken into account here? Like, how can we guarantee that the robots are up most of the time and they don't stop? So, so great point. I'd like to take that real quick. First of all, I think um, everybody expects it to last forever. That's that's the given, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so um, why doesn't it? That's I think that's the next question. So, you know, there's a couple of things there. There's and that's the the really neat thing around robotics and, and motion control or mechatronics, right? We're combining electrical and mechanical. So you have two life cycles that you have to be very concerned about. Electrical is typically heat and how you manage the heat. So I think as, as you've seen a development in the drives and the uh, as we're moving towards efficiency, right, in these products, we are continuing to re reduce the amount of heat that the components see uh, as wasted energy. And so those two things go really hand in hand as you see a design for energy efficiency, that means we're, wa we're wasting less is heat. So that means the life of the products tend to go up significantly as we reduce heat. 
the mechanical side of this is where it's also really exciting. And I think Brian spoke about all the sensors that we have inside of the, the robot and the, the drives and the motors. Well, you know, we're also seeing additional sensors like vibration sensors being added to this to make sure that these products are self-tuned so that they're, they're operating efficiently and, and not causing resonance, which can add wear and things of that nature to the, you know, you may not even be able to hear it or see it, but it, it, it is happening and affecting the mechanical solution. So we're adding vibration sensors and we're, and we're also adding safety sensors to that as well. So I think that, you know, the, and, the, and the safety plays into that, that reliability, you know, the less times you hit a hard stop, the less times you go into a situation where you have to decelerate at a very, very high load because of a safety situation, all those add to mechanical life. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's a, a really good good point. Now we have talked about the technology itself. I want to talk a little bit about the applications. Like what are those um, industrial applications that are, driving the development of these robots like if you can if any of you can talk about that like what is are those areas that are demanding these these robots i i can address that edgar um from an application point of view i mean it's it's opening up more and more uh robots we started in the automotive industry and manufacturing and have worked their way into numerous other fields logistics now and agriculture and even into the public realm and I think when we talk about motion and motor controls, ultimately what we're trying to reinvent is this thing, this, this amazing thing that we were given. And the more we can make, the, make robots more accurate, where they can do more delicate tasks, those are more tasks that we can be then freed up for. So this is when we start talking about applications, the sky's the limit, but this is enabling technology. The more accurate it can be, the more precise it can be, the more safe it can be, the cheaper it can come. So we can do more applications. All of these are coming into play now. So I think the, the sky's the limit when you come to, when you're starting to look at applications as these technologies enable us. And I, th I think the rest of the panel probably has some great ideas, but I think that's ultimately what we're talking about is how do we reinvent this thing so we can make robots do more stuff yeah can i can i piggyback onto that aaron that great great points and, and i'll tell you from a industrial um, automation provider the 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 north america market has changed significantly in the past 12 to 18 months now i've been doing this like i said for a long time but what what, what really what we are really noticing excuse me there is that the workforce challenge is raising its, its, its ugly head in a way that we've never seen or predicted that it would. Um, we used to have an ROI for in robot investment really based upon, you know, hey, can I, can I leverage my, my existing workforce in better, more efficient ways? Uh, today, the conversations are, I am losing opportunities. I cannot provide an, an opportunity. I'm losing money because I don't have the ability to provide or throw bodies at it anymore. So like you said, how do we replicate the hand so that we can now go out and do additional opportunities that, that exist? Um, you know, we saw robot orders for us surge like 40% this year alone. And it was due to non-automotive applications where, like you said, they're doing things to try to replicate the hand. So, and these are continuing to grow. The, the automotive space has always been huge for us. But it's now all these new areas that that we cannot find workers for in North America. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Those technologies that go from the end effectors. What we talk about the uh, ones for motion control, but I want to kind of do a parenthesis here and talk about those ones. Can any of you can like dive a little bit more into that? I heard magnetics, for example. So, um, who in the panel can can talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I can say a few things about uh, yeah grippers and end effectors. Um, yeah, as Aaron was saying, you really want to be able to replace the hand or to try and match the the performance of the hand, and that that's that's a huge challenge. Um, I think when one is trying to decide on a gripper or end effector to use, one should really, of course, start with the material or object that is going to be handled and use that as a guide uh, to to select the gripper. Um, or end effector, and we do see that as soon as there's a variety in the objects, so let's say variety in size and shape, uh, even materials, so whether it's a rigid or, 
or soft material, it suddenly becomes very challenging to have one gripper that can that can handle this this variation. I mean, that's what the human hand does incredibly well, can pick up such a variety of objects. So I think if you are sort of stuck with this this requirement of of variation, you could try look at, for example, a vacuum style end effector. Um, these can handle a variety of of shapes and sizes, but you have the disadvantage that they they can't. Uh, you, well, you're limited by weight, by the weight of the object that you pick up. Especially if you're moving around a lot, it's hard to really keep that that object secure. Um, Edgar, you touched on uh, magnets. Of course, there's also if your object is magnetic, you could look into electro electromagnets, which is kind of similar in a way to a vacuum, where it doesn't really matter what the, the shape of the object is. You just activate your electromagnet when you want to pick it up. Move, move the object across and then deactivate the electromagnet to, to drop it off. Uh, there's also been quite a lot of uh, progress in, in soft or deformable grippers. So again, this is trying to mimic the human hand. Um, these are also great for, for, for different forms and different shaped objects, but they have the disadvantage that it's, it's really hard to, to measure the amount of force that this deformable hand is exerting on the object because you've got this sort of soft body, it's hard to, to measure that force and to know exactly how, how hard you're gripping the object, which means that you there's a risk that you might drop it. Um, but yeah, if you don't have a lot of variety, that makes it a lot easier. You can just go with a more conventional gripper with sort of two fingers that would move toward and an, an, an apart. And, and then, then you can look into things like customizing the fingertips to sort of match your part exactly. You know, you can have a kind of like a key fit type where your, ND, your 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 fingers or your fingertips fit the part exactly. And then you'll have, you know, a really successful uh, gripping. Yeah, yeah, I hey, think that's Brian. a great point. Uh, nope. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dean. Oh. Go ahead, Dean. I was going to say is that when you talk about that, you know, you got a cup, the size that it is, the surface area, and air, you know, you're only going to be able to touch on a certain thing. If you're If I'm holding it, I can only squeeze it in a very small area compared to the total surface area. Air is the same way. If I've got a flat air system, it's going to fall off because I'm only holding it. And as I mm -hmm. fill a cup or I do something, the other problem is if I squeeze it too hard, mm -hmm. that's your other problem. So you're, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. End effectors, though, have changed so much over the last few years. There's so many new options, and they continue to be developed every day. So always consult with people because – what wasn't there yesterday, probably there's a solution for it today. Yeah, I think, I mean, Brian brought up some excellent points about all the different types of end effectors we're starting to see out there. And from a standards organization at ASTM, we're, we're trying to actually bring some standards and, and tests and performance to the, the, that kind of work. Because as Dean just showed, it's very important that we get figure out how much pressure some of these end effectors are putting on product. How much is too much? How much is needed? So we are actually working with some great scientists across the country, some NIST folks, uh, to come up with some performance and test standards that can be used for these manipulators. Because, yeah, there are just some amazing things. And us standards organizations have been a little bit behind, and this technology is accelerating. But for us to really advance even further, it's going to be great to have ways we can test how much pressure these these very unique end effectors are that come are coming to market can do? Yeah, hey, great point, Aaron. I'd like to just tack onto that. So, um, I was recently at the at the Promat show in Chicago, and I first and foremost, right in your face, is the challenge around grippers that our material handling customers are really really playing with. They have to pick up everything from a, a chapstick to a printer cartridge. You know, they come in different shapes, different sizes, different weights. So the the Additive manufacturing that we're seeing in that space to create those grippers is a really neat area for, for our, our motion control. And, and the other thing is, too, the grippers themselves. So uh, I think, Brian, you mentioned it earlier that permanent magnet motors are really kind of here to stay for, uh, for efficiency and, 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 and life. But they don't all have to be round and rotate. And so what I'm seeing is some of these are linear. And that same design, when you take that motor and you flay it out, basically, we can create linear motors that actuate just like your, your, your tendons and your hamstrings might. So I think there's a lot of opportunity coming in that space. It'll come out of the, the material handling and logistics space. 
to drive those that development for both motors and grippers. Yeah, Kevin, I and I think you, you touched on a real interesting point of because of the advances on the additive manufacturing and 3D printing technologies, we're seeing so many different end effectors come to town now. And the whole thing is, is I know a lot of uh, companies that literally can just make a custom end effector for a custom customer. And that will be the only end effector that's out there because they can now 3D print something yep. very unique for that customer. So it's it's amazing how we're seeing all these technologies across the board all coming together into what is now robotics from fixed arms to mobiles. Yep. Yep. Now, be, besides the, the gripping factor of these N effectors, like is there any um, impact that these the design of these uh, components have in the performance of the robot? Like, let's say the physics around that. Uh, is there any impact uh, on the performance? I mean, I think you, 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 when you put the end effector on, you have now changed the robot from a, just a simple robotic arm to a robot system. And so when you, it's, we always talk about when you're installing a new robot, you have to do a risk assessment. Uh, and a lot of folks like, I'm going to go get a, a, a collaborative robot because I, I just need it to be fenceless and all that. But the moment you put that end effector on that, you might have now changed the entire characteristics of the system. And is your that end effector, if it's not designed properly, or if it has sharp edges, that could change how you're going to apply that. But again, it goes back to your motors too, of how safe or how fast are your motors going to be able to hold things. But the whole thing is, is yes, the end effector is its own component. And when you add that to the system, you've changed the system. And it's the same thing. You could take that end effector off, put a different one on. You've changed the system again, and you have to go back through and just make sure you're doing everything correctly. Got it. What about now working with many robots at the same time? Like how is technology evolving on that to keep synchronize uh, a whole um, set of robots? Yeah, I think I could uh, answer, answer that one a bit. Um, I think the challenge is that each each application is is really different. It's hard to have a sort of generic solution that would cover you know each each uh, application, each uh, scenario. Um, I think a lot of a, lo a lot of what it's about is sort of to have to have sort of clearly defined goals uh, for your for your um, let's say your fleet of robots. So for example, in a warehouse, uh, the approach is to often to take a kind of to, well to see it as a sort of traffic management type of challenge for your for your fleet of robots in the warehouse, and then you would define sort of a set of rules for each uh, yeah for the for the robots that they need to follow, just like you would have uh, traffic rules. Um, but yeah, as I said, there isn't really um, kind of um, generic solutions to this. It is something that's very much. Um, you know, cutting edge right now. Um, a lot of companies are looking at things like um, uh, deploying software, you know, systems that make it really easy to deploy software across the whole fleet. But that still doesn't really, um, that doesn't sort of um, uh, handle the challenge of really getting these robots to coordinate. So a lot of it is very um, application specific and people tend to, tend to sort of tackle each each problem for its own yeah for its own challenges yeah ryan great point and if, i would tell you like in the packaging industry right now there's there's we call it load balancing where we have you know maybe you have a hundred items coming down a conveyor and the the theory or concept is not much different than what we used to do a long time ago where you would have a, a large mechanical drive shaft driving something and everything synced to it well, now you just do electronic syncing to say a conveyor belt or something of that nature, and you have multiple delta type robots or pick and place type robots pooling. And then the, the magic is how well you load balance those so that the first robot isn't trying to get every piece off the conveyor, saving stuff for others, knowing how many are behind it, what the throughput is. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of investment going on in that space to load balance those robots as well. I used to have uh, an engineer I worked with, and he used to talk about the safety aspect of things. When you when you look at multiple things happening at the same time, you have a condition there where you may think 
okay, the safest thing to do is go back to your home position. And maybe it is, but not in every case. Maybe there's something else that's in that's an obstruction now that you could then therefore force out into where people are interfacing with that robot or things like that. So you have to, it, it really, as, as Brian and, and Kevin uh, had mentioned, you have to have a very customized but flexible solution. You don't want to just say, this fits everything and this is going to solve everything. You, you do have to look at every application in it as its own entity. Thank you. Now that we are talking about synchronization of robots and we talk about a bit about the motion controls and we want to kind of highlight a topic that is, is very hot now, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, is artificial intelligence playing any role today in that control and how? I could tell you that there's there's a lot of artificial intelligence now being applied to the information we're gathering because we can gather so much more information as we've all discussed here earlier. There's a lot of information we are gathering. Now analyzing that and getting the most out of it, uh, be understanding from one part to another why there's different torque ratios, why there's different uh, motor uh, needs that we're having to apply for when we're, we got the same part, it should be the same part. Why is that? So a lot of artificial intelligence is is making our jobs smarter and telling us they aren't the same. You may look like the same. It may feel like it's the same, but it isn't. How you grip the part is very different. If I'm holding it by the edge or I'm holding it in the middle with a, with air, it can change quite a bit. As, you know, as we were talking earlier, end effectors can impact Inertia, it can impact uh, load in, in a lot of different sensors. Now, do you see it taking over uh, the main control of the robot, or are we are robots we still highly reliant on the input from those sensors and the local feedback and all that? So let me I think there's still here. Both, you, but yes, please. Yeah, so so great points. So I think AI, right, is has got uh, really two primary areas of focus. One, it's really around uh, productivity and quality and, and from us. So on the productivity side, I think you're going to see AI really, as Dean mentioned, you know, how do you, how do you optimize a robot move? How do you pick up the part correctly? Always tweaking, right? It's always trying to improve on that uh, wow. because the, what we thought were parts that don't change do change. Right. And so, so an automation is really only as good as the consistency of the part that you're delivering on the quality side is this is also another area that we're seeing a tremendous amount is, is let's say that that product stretches or, or a temperature affects the length or the density. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of, of increased quality because we can tweak the pick place or the cut location that the robot is doing based on uh, more active inputs than what we might have been using before really great example like a rubber strip or a piece for maybe tire manufacturing where you you feed that but today it's 32 degrees and, and you know fahrenheit tomorrow it's 85 or you have a little bit less or more torque on it that the cut length is going to vary and if it, the cut length is very important to the quality you can now monitor more inputs to adjust that uh pick location or cut location than we could before and apply more than just a index it out 12 inches and have a robot go pick it up here. Right. So we're seeing tremendous, that's where we think AI is going to have a tremendous impact for us. Got it. Let's just start talking a little bit about the future, how the future look like for robots. And uh, Aaron, you mentioned in, uh, uh, before about how N effectors are now to approach the human hand and all that. So how far are we for having I don't know, robots fully replacing a, a worker, like uh, from technology wise. I, 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 I think, yeah, yeah I, I think that we have a really bright future ahead of us uh, that we're, we're seeing already research being done, like in the previous conversation about AI and how much data we're starting to collect. And like Amazon just dumped a, all over hundred thousands of images that they have picked and placed and they just gave it away to the rest of the world of like, here, this is how we figured this out. And that's that kind of collaboration, I think across numerous uh, companies and, and industries 
is really going to advance us forward. Are we going to start replacing humans? Yes, no kind of stuff. Uh, we will. What we will be doing is we'll be moving folks out of ta- those dull, dirty, dangerous tasks that we don't like doing, no one likes doing, and putting the automation and the robotics in those tasks and moving the folks into other roles. We, are, we talked earlier about today about the labor shortage. And the whole thing is, is there are 10,000 baby boomers hitting retirement age every day. And th- there's nothing coming behind them to replace them. So the whole thing is, is we are going to continue to have this. And we're just going to have to be very creative of we need to put this automation into those dull, dirty, dangerous tasks so we can free up our human labor to do the more important tasks, the the tasks that require more thinking and thought processes. And I think as we see these new drives and these new technologies and new end effectors come to market, we're going to be able to do a lot of great things. It's just we need more folks actually helping us just to deploy it and get it out there. Well, I'll say it. And... What, what about the hardware? The, is, is, is the hardware really going to catch up with that? Like, do we have um, uh, enough hardware to be able to produce a robot that doesn't consume so much energy that can easily walk with a small battery around? So I love this one, right? And I this this comes up every day for me. And it's still, I get to explain it to my kids. You know, it's <laughs> my cell phone is more power than what the Apollo 13 rocket admission had on its entire capacity. It has a GPS signal uh, s- s- chip on it that is smaller than my thumbprint that can pinpoint my accuracy anywhere on the globe within a meter. So do you, so to say that, that our hardware won't catch up, absolutely it'll catch up. Uh, you know, the, the, the technology, the growth every, what, 20, uh, 50% every year to, um, so yes, I have no doubt that this will catch up. It'll get smaller. It'll get faster. It'll get less uh, energy consumption. Um, and so I'm excited to, to Aaron's point. I'm very excited about where the technology will go here in the near future. Fantastic. We have a few minutes uh, left and I want to hear from Dean and Brian what they think about the future of, of uh, motion controls in, in robotics. Dean, I want to start with you. I think that when we look at the future, we look at all the applications that we're not currently leveraging. And there are a lot of them. And a lot of that will be compressing of the size to fit into new applications, reaching, being able to change the physics aspects of things. Instead of moving in where we're changing a robot's angle using two a- two axes, using it more like what we were talking about earlier of the hand of how do we get it to where it's it's turning. And if you see some of the end effectors where we're using things like an octopus or squid style, where it's wrapping around and grabbing something, that will change where we can put robots into and, and where those those applications will fit. I believe that there's going to be more and more opportunity. We're not going to use less robots. <laughs> I can tell you that right now, that is not going to happen. There's more applications every day. We just have to find out how we fit those applications. Understood. Thank you, Dean. What about you, Brian? Yeah, I guess um, as we we speak about, uh, you know, we have well, we have spoke about robots slowly replacing humans. We might also come across more and more situations where the robot and the human are, are coming to close contact. So of course, what's you know been a really hot topic for a while is cobots or collaborative robots. Uh, and a big a big uh, factor there is of course safety. You know how do you uh, not only um, you know build a, a robot that's safe to to have humans around, but then also how do you thoroughly prove that the robot's safe so that this this can be released to to market. And I think um, uh, as as Kevin touched on with the hardware constantly getting faster and constantly getting smaller and, and improving, we'll see new sensors pop out. We'll see new actuators that we hadn't thought about. Also, like as, again, as, as Kevin mentioned, this unrolling of the 
uh, permanent magnet brushless uh, DC motors that could also open up new new uh, applications that could um, you know ultimately lead lead to 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 collaborative robots being safe and that we can really be certain that they are they are safe to to work uh, alongside humans. Thank you, Brian. It has been an excellent discussion, but we have reached the end of the time that we have for today. So what we're going to do is pass it to Matt just to check if we have questions from our audience, and we'll go to a session of questions and answers. So back to you, Matthew. Thank you all so much for that great presentation. As Edgar mentioned, we are going to move into the question and answer session. If you have a question for us today, please go ahead and enter it in the Q&A box and hit submit. We will get to as many questions as we can. However, if we don't get to your question, don't worry, we will reach out following today's session. Now, Edgar, I will pass it back to you and the group to answer some of our attendees' questions. Thank you, Matt. So we are back with some questions from our audience. So we have received several of them, and we selected four. Um, I'm going to go with the first question, and it says, what type of robot would independent cards be classified as? And what is unique about the motion control of these technologies? I think, Kevin, that's, that's one for you. Yeah, I'd love to take this one. Thank you, Edgar. Um, so independent card technology is um, an emerging technology, but it's a point and click technology. So when you talk about uh, differences in programming, uh, you know, you, you, you do point to point or following or tracking with, a, say, a scare robot. So because it's it's a, a point to point, you're telling a product on puck A to go to point B and it takes care of the navigation. I think it clearly falls into uh, an AMR or a, a mobile robot type of, of classification. In fact, so we've, we've actually done some uh, applications with customers where, you know, the, where they might use an AMR, but because of floor space. They can take the uh, they can take an independent cart technology, hang it from the ceiling, open up floor space, and still uh, move and, and have logistics across their facility um, uh, by doing the point and click with a without an AMR and leveraging an independent cart. So uh, I think it falls into the AMR, and I think the, the the differences are that instead of going from point to point or following a contour, or doing a path, you're you're doing a, 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 a to, to quote I guess what set and forget you're telling it where to go and it takes care of its own navigation and delivers the part, the right part at the right time to the right location. Thank you, Kevin. So the next question says, what sensing technologies are mostly used for safety? I think that says, say a question goes to, to Brian. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, yeah. So there are uh, numerous sensors. I think there's, there's a couple that we can kind of put in the category of sort of um, more simple or dare I say sort of dumbed down type of sensors where you might just have a simply have a kind of uh, laser which makes a kind of light curtain around the the workspace of the robot so as soon as the human walks and of course trips that that laser that laser sensor that 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 laser signal that would then stop the robot uh, what we common, commonly see in industry is maybe a series of these lasers where when the first one is tripped, the robot would maybe switch to 50% speed. When the second one is tripped, maybe 10%. So it's going really slow. And of course, when you trip the third one, the robot stops completely. Um, in a similar cat category as these sort of simple sensors might be a kind of mat. So almost like a carpet, uh, pressure carpet or pressure mat, where again, as soon as you it feels the pressure of someone stepping on it, again, you start to uh, step down the uh, speed of the, the arm, for example. Uh, more advanced type of sensors, which are still a lot in, in development, and uh, these might also apply not just to robot arms, but to to uh, AGVs and AMRs also, are kind of uh, what's called sort of capacitive skin. So the 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 skin of the the arm of the robot is able to uh, capacitively sort of sense when a person comes close, and use that to kind of control the speed or to to stop the speed. Um, Another example, which I, I touched on a little bit about gyro sensors. So gyro sensors also might, uh, they'd have to be tuned very precisely, but of course, as soon as they see a kind of um, unexpected spike uh, in, in the gyro or IMU sensor data, you would then stop. Of course, this is the, the problem with this is that you've already, you've already had to make contact with the person. So you'd have to really 
fine tune the um, the gyro data such that the uh, the robot stops very quickly before it does any kind of any kind of harm. Great, thank you, Brian. So the next question um, is for Aaron. So the, says, the question says, will industrial robots be receptive to voice or gesture controls in the future? Absolutely. I think that's actually going to be the next big uh, human robot interaction, HRI event. And I, I just think it's just the, the next natural progression in, in the evolution of robotics. And also it's going to be how we also can get more folks involved in robotics. Uh, it's interesting is I've been in a warehouse where there are mobile robots going around and most of the staff is legally blind. So how it was an amazing project that they pulled off, but it's, that's the kind of thing that robots are going to enable in the future to do more for humans. But for that to do that, they're going to have to be able to hear our voice understand what we're doing and then also how our hand gestures if we talked about a lot of collaborative applications if you really want to have a true hand-to-hand -hand collaborative application between a human and a robot that communication that human communication has to be the key element so yes i really do see it coming thank you Aaron. And the last question we picked today uh, from our audience goes to Dean. So the question says, how are we making robots more accessible? I think if I interpret that correctly, when we talk about accessibility, how will the human or operator interface with the, with the robot? And this is, to me, it's, it's a workforce question because we do have a shortage of, of workers and experienced operators. So if we can make the interface to where people can access it easily and also standardize, so that if you have multiple robots, you want the same interface so it looks and feels the same for everybody who's getting involved with it, we're heading that way right now. And we're not that far off for, for many of the companies that, that are getting involved in these robots. When you think about it, when we started with robots years ago, the interface was really different. You had to be a, a full-blown programmer to be able to work on a robot. It, you needed to know coding and you needed to speak dif have different languages that you could, uh, you could interface with. Now, a lot of the interfaces that come on robots have an interface where it can actually talk in more common language. It can be simpler almost to the point of where you look at how like the Lego robot competitions are and things like that. It's very drag and drop. It's much more simpler for us to interface. And that's what we want. The more accessible it is for people, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to find a worker that can fit with that type of an operation. All they need to know is I need to take this from here. I need to move it here. And if that's what I have to do, whether it's drag and uh, move placement systems that are uh, learn type of systems, or whether it's a system where I actually tell it point A to point B, those types of systems are, we're already there. And some of them just need to interface more common language uh, within their entire set of robots that they have out there. So yes, I think uh, accessibility is something that we are driving towards Everybody who's in this industry sees the benefit of that. Perfect. Thank you, Dean. Now I have a question myself about that. So uh, can we expect at one point to have like one common way to interact with all these robots or would they like vary it depending on the manufacturer? That sounds like a Kevin question. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so let's, let's, you know, we, we covered it a little bit today. Um, you heard it from Brian about sensors. You heard it, Dean, about accessibility. You know, we didn't dive into the topic of vision today, but vision is there. So if, if you're talking about interfacing with a physical device that includes, that has vision, that can com communicate in a common standard, and has sensors and safety, uh, and recognizes potentially voice commands, yeah, I, I, I don't think we're very far off from having something that uh, anybody and everybody can very soon uh, address, uh, program, communicate with, 
uh, and 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 leverage uh, this type of device in, in any opportunity within a facility or process application or assembly manufacturing uh, very, very shortly. Thank you. Well, Kevin, Dean, Brian, and Aaron, thank you very much for being today with us and sharing like your time, knowledge, experience with our audience and for this excellent discussion. So that concludes the roundtable uh, today, and we hope uh, our audience to also join us for the other sessions that we have in, in this series. Um, and we appreciate really that you were here um, accompanying us in this, in this discussion. So we are also grateful to Rockwell uh, and the Restart experts who are uh, doing a lot to bring smart manufacturing a reality. And finally, to globalspec.com, thank you for the million of technical professional engineers who have allowed us to connect them to the parts and services they need for project success. So now, Matt, back to you. Thank you, Edgar. And now just a few items before we end things today. I would like to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists and to Edgar for leading our discussion. And a special thank you to Rockwell Automation for sponsoring this Realizing the Potential of Industrial Robots series. Today was session two of our four-part series. Please join us for the rest of the sessions. You can visit our series page using the link listed in the resource widget. Sign up for all the sessions today. You won't want to miss it. And one last thank you to our audience members for being here with us today. You will be receiving an email from us with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation, so you will be able to come back and watch this again or share it with your colleagues. Again, thank you for taking the time to attend this Global Specs series. Take care, and we will talk with you soon.